a bit about my background. I have a, a degree in animal science, a PhD in animal science. I then worked in the States for eight and a half years. I'm massively data driven. I, I always want data on everything. You know, give me data and I'm really, really, really happy. Believe me, I don't have all the answers. I wish I did. You know, I really, really don't. So I'm just kind of going to talk about my experience in, in talking about the things that I talk to, to various audiences, going from people who know nothing about agriculture whatsoever, all the way through to farmers and ranchers. And again, kind of on a global basis. And the ag industry really faces a dual challenge, because on the one hand, we've got more and more and more people. So we're going to have about 9.5 billion people on the planet by the year 2050 or so. And on average, those people are going to have more income. They want more milk, more meat, and more eggs. So globally, we need to make more beef, more pork, and more poultry. But we've got to do that in a manner that saves land, saves resources, saves carbon, saves energy. Because per person, we're going to have less land per person. So we face this challenge of how to do this in a way that is economically viable, environmentally responsible, but also satisfies the consumer. And that's the bit that's been really difficult for the ag industry, because farmers and ranchers are really, really good at doing what they do every single day. Talking to people, particularly people who don't understand agriculture, comes you know, way down that list. That's way out of their comfort zone. So part of my role is to try and give them some facts and some figures and some data points and some ways to talk about what they do that hopefully gets it over a little bit better to the consumer. But we do have a problem because we have the activist groups. This is one of the more kind of PG-13 pictures I could show. This is from PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. This particular demonstration was in London, but it's gone global as well, and they get more kind of shocking and risque with every demonstration that they do. But not surprisingly, you know, two <coughs> naked girls in a bath sends a really powerful message to quite a lot of consumers. And when you add in some numbers here as well, 50 baths equals one steak, clean your conscience, go vegan. Again, that sounds scientific. There's some data there. Whether that data is right or not is, well, it isn't debatable, it's completely wrong. And there's no reference or source or peer-reviewed paper at the bottom of that sign. But again, to the people going past, they just go, whoa, there were two naked girls there and it says we should go vegan and save the planet. You know, that's a powerful message that gets that across to all the people out there who are just simply going, I don't know what I should eat to care about the planet, to save the planet going forwards. And that's particularly important. This is actually some data from the States, but we've seen the same pattern globally. We have access to far more information now. We've got Twitter, we've got Google, we've got Instagram, Facebook, you know, Oprah, Dr. Oz, all of these people telling us what to eat, what, should we, what we should care about. And about two thirds of people are somewhat or very interested in how food is made. And that's great. That gives us a real opportunity to talk. But unfortunately, the talking is often done by the outlets that are not necessarily so informed. And I kind of feel like the Daily Mail is the perfect um, epitome of the ill-informed media outlet, because they seem to hate everybody, regardless <laughs> of age, gender, you know, race, economic status, etc. And everything becomes, you're going to die. You know, everything causes cancer, according to the Daily Mail. Well, in this instance, this was talking about a dairy down in the um, East Anglia area. And I know that Amy can tell you more about this if, um, if you're interested. But again, in the media, this became this huge cattle factory. Cows hooked up 24 hours to machines, treated like robots, etc., etc., etc. And I have to tell you, I'm proud to have gone to hundreds of farms on a global basis, and I've never, ever been to a cattle farm that I would consider a factory farm, where the farmer treats their animals like robots, or as things that aren't alive and feeling every day. But to the consumer, they see this and go, wow, oh, that's that factory farm thing everybody knows farmers are bad. So as science-based people, what's our instinct, or what's my instinct, is to give them some data. It's okay. In England, about 50% of the cows are in herds that have less than 49 cows. So <coughs> most herds are small. There's the data, you know, you should be happy, it's all good. And only 7.8% are in larger herds. But people still go, well, why are there some cows in larger herds? Why do we need large herds? Why are they important? Aren't they bad? 
from a planet point of view, from a welfare point of view, from a food point of view, and so on and so on. And then the activist groups say, no, it's okay, because on a big farm they look like this. And yes, there are farmers that don't do a good job. And I wish I could say that every farm in the world does a perfect job every single day. But as we all know, that doesn't happen. There are bad farms, there are bad hospitals, there are bad you know, conference centres. There's always bad apples in some industry somewhere. Unfortunately for agriculture, the activist groups are very keen to take the pictures and post them all over Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, often with no context and often even if it's a picture from overseas or a picture taken in lighting or at an angle that shows something that isn't actually happening. Obviously, this picture, there's no excuse whatsoever. You know, no farmer should ever keep their cows in these type of conditions. But again, it's one farm out of millions and millions of farms globally where people are doing a really good job. But when this is out there on a billboard, you know, people go, ooh, that looks really bad. And it does look bad. You know, perhaps we shouldn't drink milk. Perhaps we shouldn't eat beef. So what do we do? Well, we come back with science. We say it's okay. There's a good report came out from the um, US EFRA, and it said that on an individual cow basis, it doesn't matter whether she's in a small herd or a large herd. Her health and welfare absolutely depend on the management of that herd. And everyone goes, oh, that's great, but what about those cows I saw up to their necks in mud? You know, that isn't a good thing. Just because a scientific report somewhere says it's okay, that doesn't mean that I feel that it's okay. And that's the biggest challenge that we have to overcome. We can throw all the data out there and all the science points and all the decimal points. And if people go, well, I just, I still don't feel comfortable with this and confident that the food that I buy <coughs> is safe, affordable and comes from well-treated animals, then I'm not happy with it. And I'm not going to buy dairy or beef or pork or broccoli even, whatever that food might be. And that's partly because as, as people, we are predisposed to believe bad news, which is presumably why the Daily Mail is still so very popular. You know, bad news sells. I mean, good news, like everything's great, folks, this is fine, that doesn't sell newspapers. Tragedy sells, as we saw this morning, very unfortunately. You know, bad news sells every single time. And now, again, we have Twitter, we have Facebook, this particular lady has, has, has co-written a very uh, anti-animal agriculture book. We have tweets like this. Yes, we use antibiotics in animals to keep them healthy. And from a health point of view, from a welfare point of view, and from an ethical point of view, we need to do that. But it gets turned into rearing animals on grotesque factory farms where they get sick squandering antibiotics. So we see these bad news things, and it takes five pieces of positive information, five pieces of, it's okay, we're doing good things, the industry is good, to overcome just one of these tweets, which can go around the world in literally, you know, seconds, minutes, hours. And this factory firm, factory <coughs> farm term is really quite dangerous. Some data came out last year from the, the AHDB, which is the, the um, levy board for UK dairy farmers. And in terms of factory farming, about two-thirds of people have heard that term. Not surprisingly, <coughs> most of them associate it with chickens. That makes perfect sense. Some with pigs, but also about a third of, with dairy cows and about 25% with beef, beef cattle. And the definition of a factory farm seems to be, and it does vary massively according to who you ask, but it seems to be animals kept in conditions where they can't move, turn around, express natural behaviours and so on. Well, I drove down to Penzance about three weeks ago now, and all the way down the M4 and, and then the M5 were dairy cows out on pasture. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of them. And then some beef cows, and then some dairy cows. You know, these are not factory farms. And yet we still have this image that cattle over here are kept in factory farms. The reason I want to talk about this is this, this label, as it were, just shows how, how, quite frankly, gullible we are. This paper came out last year, again, in the States, and I just, I just love it because it shows really how daft we all are. Samples of beef jerky, absolutely <coughs> identical, okay? Same packaging, same color, same taste, absolutely identical, same process, same meat. 
The only difference was the green ones are labelled humane, the yellow ones are labelled factory. When consumers tasted those meats, all across the board, the factory was consistently scored lower in terms of appearance, smell, taste and enjoyment. It was exactly the same meat. There was no difference whatsoever. But simply the presence of that label on the meat made people think, this doesn't smell as good, this doesn't taste as good, I don't like this as much. And I know that we all have those type of perceptions. You know, we all think Heinz baked beans are better than own brand beans because it says Heinz, even if they've come from the same factory. We may think that Levi's jeans are better than Tesco jeans because of the label. But it just shows how one label that, that sort of describes the farming system can have a huge impact on what should be objective measures of enjoyment of a food. So all of these labels and these facts that we see out there can have a really damaging effect. Now what has worked fairly well in the ag industry is to have open farm Sundays. This is a farm down in Somerset. I had the pleasure of visiting it again with Amy about, gosh, five or six years ago now probably. At that point there was 1,200 cows and there were 12 sick cows on that entire operation. That's a 1% sickness rate. Now I can't imagine that in any workplace, school, nursery, family, you would ever have as low as a 1% sickness rate. And yet, this is a huge farm. This is bad, right? Well, they had this tweet, and this was after a farm, op farm open day. So there's people everywhere, there's noise, there's movement, and these cows are so chill, they almost... I mean, they're just like the happiest cows you've ever seen. You know, so the ag industry has done some good things in terms of reaching out to the consumer and saying, look, this is what we do. We care for our animals. We help them. We want them to perform in the best way that we can. But again, to quite a lot of people, the fact that these cows are housed will automatically mean, well, that must be bad. You know, housing is bad, pasture is good, right? Inside is bad, outside is good. Management is absolutely key. But in this binomial world, we want good and bad, black and white, yes and no. We want simple answers. This quote came from one of my best friends back in the States. She was 35 at, at the time, and her kids were about two and four, I should think. And she said, I just want to know what to buy and what to feed my kids. And she's a highly intelligent person. She's a lawyer. Her, her husband is a professor of entomology. These are educated people. They have the income, the time, and she still said, I just want to be told what I should feed my family. And that's great if she's getting balanced scientific information in terms of being told. If she's looking to the US equivalent of the Daily Mail, the choices that she's making are not necessarily going to be congruent with safe, affordable, sustainable, etc. So we do face this challenge. And we have to put it into context for people. Because as I say, we don't have the time to research, but we'll see cartoons like this. And hormones in, in both beef and dairy are a thing that I've been talking about for about five or six years now. Principally in the States and overseas, but also over here as well. There's this perception that dairy and beef are pumped full of hormones. We're <coughs> healthier and better if we just ate soy juice or broccoli or tofu or something else. By the way, I was a vegan and, um, for about a year when I was 16, so I'm not anti-vegan, vegetarian, broccoli, tofu, etc. But there is that perception out there that the plant-based foods must be better for us from a hormone point of view. So I have these conversations with people, and again, generally friends, generally intelligent, or I would like to think so, you know, relatively um, good income, sensible people who just want to be told, what should I eat, you know, what do I buy my kids? And the conversation goes something like, well, we're not eating beef and dairy anymore of all, because of all the hormones. And I stand up a little bit straighter, and I get a little bit cross, and I say, well, why, you know? Well, everybody knows they're pumped full of hormones. They're the reason that our kids are six foot two at the age of five, they have breasts at the age of six, you know, it's the hormones and the beef and dairy. That's okay. Because we've got to put it into context for people. So if we put it into context, 
One litre of milk contains 10 nanograms of oestrogen. That's basically a very, 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 very tiny concentration. Okay, really, 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 really small. The birth control pill, by contrast, taken by 100 million women on a global basis every single day, 35,000 nanograms of oestrogen. If you wanted to get the same amount of oestrogen from milk as you would from one birth control pill, you'd have to drink 3,500 litres of milk every single day. In context, that's about as much as the average person would drink in about 20 years if they drank a pint a day. I mean, that's huge, 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 huge quantities of milk. Yes, there were hormones in milk, there were hormones in beef, there were hormones in apples and soy and tofu. There were hormones in everything we eat every single day, apart from sugar and salt. <coughs> but if we put it into context for the consumer, go, okay, well, I was on the birth control pill for a year, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. That was my choice, but now I can see that the, that the consequence of dairy is, is tiny compared to all the other things that I do, all the changes that I make every single day. Now, having said that, the data doesn't always work. I had the pleasure of, oh my goodness, my daughter's drawn all over her legs. <laughs> Sorry, I should laugh because she looks like she's been tattooed. Um, <laughs> pens are obviously not a good idea in conference. I had the pleasure of being in Washington, D.C. This, again, was about, actually, it was almost exactly four years ago because I was pregnant with this one over here. And I had the pleasure of talking to a journalist for the National Geographic. Again, a balanced, scientific, global publication. And I was talking about grass-fed and corn-fed beef. And in a nutshell, because grass-fed beef takes so much longer to raise than corn-fed beef, despite the extra inputs in terms of corn and soy and transport for feedlot type beef, grass-fed beef tends to have a higher carbon footprint. So I went through all of the numbers, you know, one plus one equals two, times two equals four, divided by two equals two, you know, blah, 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 all of it, very scientific, very data-based. And at the end he said, this is great, and I, and I get all the numbers, and I understand all of this, but I just feel that grass-fed beef is better. And I said, I can't really do anything <coughs> about that, because that's a feeling, that's a belief. And that's what makes some of this so difficult to get over, you know. When we talk about hormones, when we talk about GMOs, when we talk about science, if the person you're talking to feels that this is bad and this is good, overcoming that feeling is almost impossible, as particularly with lots of science, lots of data. Now, I tend to have fewer one-on-one -on -one type conversations, lots on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and so on and so on. But there is no doubt that we can't go in with the science straight away. You know, if we have a query about isn't dairy bad for the planet or isn't cow welfare bad, we can't just jump in with the science shows 24%, 36%, 4.1, blah, blah, blah. We've lost the people. You know, we've lost them instantly. We have to make that personal connection, whether we're in ag, whether we're in any other part of science or engineering, Basically, in any industry, we have to make that personal connection first. We have to reassure the person asking questions that we also care about the land, the water, our kids, our grandkids, and the economics of the product that we make. And if we do that, if we make that personal connection first, then we tend to do far better. I had the... Um, Sometimes it becomes more difficult because we're trying to communicate people, communicate with people with, that are at such a distance. But also what helps is the fact that we tend to identify and share opinions with people who we perceive as being like us or who we think we want to be like. And that's the only reason I can think of that Gwyneth Paltrow gets so much popularity for all of her food ideas, which are sometimes quite insane, quite honestly, because people go, well, she does it, and she's famous and thin and beautiful, so if I do it, you know, perhaps I'll be that person. So if we can share those values, and particularly if we can influence the people who influence others, like these mom food blogger type people, we can then have a far bigger reach, because these guys reach thousands and thousands of people every single day globally. Now, I had the real pleasure, and this was a real honor, really, to have an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. This is about uh, two years ago now, I think about it. And it was on, again, grass-fed beef versus grain-fed beef. 
And of course, the scientist in me said, you've got 500 words, you've got to cram as many facts and figures as you possibly can in. Every data point has to be in there, because it's all about data, and it's, this is great, and you can reach all these people with all this data. And then, possibly for one of like the three times in, in my life, I took my own advice, and went back to the people that read the Wall Street Journal aren't generally in agriculture. They don't have that link to agriculture. They're lawyers or they're doctors or they're politicians, they're people in New York and Seattle and LA and so on and so on. They don't really know that this is a beef cow, not a dairy cow, or a sheep or a pig even. So even though we only had 500 words, I began and I wasted a whole 15 words or so on as an animal scientist, as a researcher, and as a mother of a toddler, this is why I choose feedlot beef. To make that connection, to make the connection with all the people who have no connection to ag, know nothing about animal science or beef or meat science, but go, oh, well, I'm a parent as well, or a grandparent, or an aunt, or a cousin. You know, I care about my kids, my grandkids, my nieces, my nephews. And science shows, as it were, that mothers who are also scientists have possibly the highest credibility of anybody out there. Presumably because people think she's a scientist, she has the technical understanding and the knowledge, and she's managed to produce a child and cares for that child, feeds that child, clothes it, you know, so on, so on. So science mothers Apologies to science fathers, but science mothers appear to have the highest credibility of anybody out there in terms of talking about science type issues. So that's a real opportunity for us all to leverage that. As I say, I spend too much time on Twitter. My Twitter bubble, of course, is, tends to be comprised of the same kind of people, which means that in my mind, there's basically two lots of people on Twitter. There's farmers and there's angry vegans, and it seems to be about 50-50. Um, and I argue with them, and they argue with me, you know, and I get called a rapist and a murderer, and I say, well, I was vegan in the past. And then she actually said, if you're an ex-vegan, you weren't a proper vegan in the first place. So like, well, I was 50, you know, for goodness sake. Anyway, so in my brain, there's the, there's the pro-ag people and there's the angry vegans, you know, and that seems to be it on Twitter. And yes, we have the arguments, you know, and I know there is no way on this planet that I'm going to change her mind about anything to do with the animal agriculture. You know, she might concede maybe that not all farmers are totally evil, but she's not going to go, you know what, I'm going to go and eat a cheeseburger, this will be fabulous. But again, what we have to remember is for every tweet that we send, there's lots of other people who see it and don't like it or quote it or reply to it, but see the debate and go, actually, maybe this person has some good points, and maybe this person actually seems to have some science, hopefully, and some data and stuff, rather than just going, you're a rapist and a murderer and you're bad, you know? So we've got the pro people and the anti people, and we will always have those people, and we're not going to change their minds. You know, it's not going to happen. But in the middle, we've got that huge amount of people who just want to be reassured that they're doing the right thing for their family, that they're buying the right food. And if we focus there and think about influencing those people, we can really make a difference on all sorts of issues to the agriculture, food, and science as a whole. Again, data from the States, who do people trust? This is only about food, friends and family, farmers and ranchers, and doctors, basically the top three. The fact that two-thirds of people trust their friends and family for food in, um, information sounds really good. That means a third of people don't trust their friends and family for information. I look at my friends and family, it makes absolutely perfect sense. <laughs> but it shows that we can have a huge reach on things like Facebook, where in theory everybody that we're friends with on there is our actual friend or family or co-worker. We can influence lots of people with simple message, simple graphics. Not surprisingly, perhaps, people don't really trust the mass media, they don't trust the big pharmaceutical companies, and no surprise here, they don't trust the politicians. And the fact that 19% of people do trust them for 
food information is quite honestly far higher than I thought it would be, because I thought it would be about 5% down here. So we've got to choose our audience, and we've got to choose the people that we uh, that are going to take that message out to that audience, because some fairly obviously have a far higher credibility rating, as it were, than others. So with that, almost my last slide, this was a picture. I used to kind of use and abuse my child when she was... Um, she had less of a stubborn streak, let's say, and would pose far more happily for pictures when she was three months old than she will now. And I put this on Facebook. And there's no actual data there. There's no numbers and stats and figures and so on. But I wanted like a feel-good image, and I wanted to educate people to some degree. Because quite often people don't understand that baby formula actually comes from dairy milk in, all, in almost all cases. Where they think it comes from, I'm not entirely sure. But I put it on Facebook, and I thought it would get shared or liked by about four or five friends, you know? It got shared by over 200 people in about four hours. So we can have huge reach just with a picture of a relatively cute child <laughs> and some happy information. You know, we don't have to always have lots of data, lots of numbers. We just need, this makes me feel good about drinking milk or eating cheese or eating ice cream. So with that, um, Summary quickly here, we've got to have the shared values. If, if we don't have them in the first place, if we just jump in with science shows that 24% of people tweet every three seconds, you know, whatever it might be, it's gone, you know. We've lost that audience, we've lost that opportunity. We've got to answer their concerns and not just go into every bit of information we can ever think of about whatever the issue is. Their concerns are the most important thing to answer, first of all. We've got to put it into context for them, and we've got to focus on those people in the middle. We can change their minds. We can't change the minds of the very anti in the middle, but we can change all those people in the middle of that bell-shaped curve. And, much I hate to say it, to some degree, Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Instagram are becoming increasingly important, and I honestly don't think that's going to change. We'll probably have different outlooks in two years, five years, ten years, but that popularity and, and that information source isn't going to change. And we have a huge opportunity, but we're also faced with a huge challenge, because obviously we can have some very negative images and bits of information out there on there as well. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much. Not surprisingly, I'm on social media. And there's a copy of this, that present of this presentation at this link right here, or I can always email it to you. So feel free to get in touch if you have questions in you know, two weeks, two years, whatever it might be. And uh, with that, thank you so much. And I guess we're open for questions. Thank you.